Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. We're going to take a deeper dive into putting uh, these verses in Daniel chapter 11, uh, verse 25 and on, onto lines dealing with the Battle of Actium, etc. So before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Uh, dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for the time that we have here this morning uh, to open your word. And we are thankful for the light that you have been giving us. And we just pray for your continued leading in the things that we study, uh, that they can be relevant um, and correct. We pray for one another, pray for this movement, this message. And we just ask, Lord, that we can be faithful in the part that you've given us to do. Thank you for hearing our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, so yesterday we, we did kind of an overview of the problem that we have to face in putting these things on a line. So we had done the line of, of papal Rome, the papacy, the line of the papacy. And, and we understand uh, we have lines dealing with uh, the end of pagan Rome, dealing with the Battle of Actium, um, you know, all the way to 508. We have that 666 years of Rome. And we even looked at the present truth application of how we we line up those lines with with our history. We haven't drawn this on a line. So we know that this is a zoom into the battle of, of Actium. So in verse 25 and 26, it's going to address that. So the battle of Actium, we have the king of the north defeating the king of the south. So we know that this typifies our history. And so we're going to try to put this on a line. Now, verses 27 and 28 are a zoom into that history as well. Right. So this this goes back and looks at the alliance between Antony and Octavian, who later becomes Augustus. And and that one's going to give us a reference. It's going to reference to the time appointed at the end of the prophetic periods. So it's going to reference us back to um, the time of the end. Right. And in, in, in Millerite history. So I, I haven't decided how how this is going to look. And remember, everything that we do, we we take these verses as the information that we, God has given us to place it on a line. So the first thing I think um, that I would like to do before I even draw the line itself is to look at the present truth application. And, and that might aid us a little bit to figure out, because if we can figure out well, for instance, we know that the United States conquering the papacy is an application that we can put at 1989, USA in the papacy, you know, stirs up his power against Egypt. So we know this is 1989 and we have that part already there. Um, and we can see the parallel with Daniel 11 verse 40 B. We should be able to see that pretty clearly. And then we have to look at a lot of the symbols that are here and, and decide how those symbols help us. So, for instance, when we looked at this symbol of power, we looked at power and courage and we added those together. And that gave us uh, 7405, the Hebrew number 7405, which means to bind. And we find that in Exodus 28, 28. So we've already looked at some of those those symbols. And the question is, how do we address those on our lines? Okay. So, so when it says, and he shall stir up, right? So that's going to be H5782 and his power and courage. We added those together. And those are going to be stirred up against the king of the south, right? So 5921 is a word we see all the time. King of the south, we've addressed that uh, with the great army. 1419, army is 2428. I've added those together, anything. So this binding, so let's look at this, this word bind. So this in Exodus 2828. Do we remember what the binding was? Anybody? What that was about? It's going to be about the ephod. Okay. 
So the ephod says in Exodus 28, 28, and they shall bind the breastplate by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate be not loosed from the ephod. We add power and courage together and we get this Hebrew number. I guess I should show you what I'm looking at. So this is Exodus 28, 28. They shall bind the breastplate by the rings. That word bind is 7405. And so I get that number by adding power and courage together. And, and Exodus 28, 28. So why would Exodus 28, 28 be significant? 28 represents what? The four seven times. Yeah, four times seven, right? And it's doubled. So the doubling represents midnight in the midnight cry. And so, so that's why I said this verse was significant in that we can take this word bind and we can go back to this uh, verse. So, I mean, this may seem a little bit obscure in some ways to do this. Now, there is uh, another place where it's also mentioned, and that's in Exodus 39, 21. And it's just going to deal with the same thing. They did bind the breastplate by his rings unto the rings of the ephod with the lace of blue, that it might be above. So it, the one it says, they shall bind. This one it says, they did bind. Um, but if you, if you look at, at the Hebrew numbers here, this is pretty much exactly word for word. So let me see, where is it? The only difference is it's going to add as the Lord commanded Moses. So really it's, it's the same, it's the same words exactly. Once they shall bind and they did bind, that's the only difference is where they put it into a tense, right? So they changed the tenses. I'm just going to look at the, um, the Hebrew here, how different they are. I don't think there's any, yeah, they're identical. So the tenses are just something added in English. So this, this verse is doubled, right? It is, it's the only place we have this word bind. And it's in two different verses, which are identical, except the one has, as the Lord commanded Moses at the end. We know the breastplate, of course, the significance of that. That's going to be on, on the high priest and this binding of the breastplate to the ephod. What What is the purpose of this breastplate and ephod? It's also called the breastplate of judgment. You know that on the breastplate, I'm just going to read what it says here. They shall bind the breastplate of the rings by the rings thereof unto the rings of the ephod with a lace of blue, that it may be above the curious girdle of the ephod and that the breastplate be not loose from the ephod. And Aaron shall bear the names of the children of Israel in the breastplate of judgment upon his heart when he goeth in unto the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. And thou shalt put in the breastplate of judgment the Urim and the Thummim, and they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon the heart before the Lord continually. So you have this ephod with the breastplate bound to it, and then you have the Urim and Thummim. And the Urim and Thummim, those are used for basically communicating with God. So there's lot, lots of speculation people have about this breastplate and the Urim and Thummim. They mean lights and perfections or manifestation and truth. And we also have in Leviticus 8.8. 8, so we have another verse that's a direct doubling, like Exodus 28.28. 28. And of course, 8 is an important symbol, especially the two eights. He put the breastplate upon him. Also, he put the breastplate, the Urim and Thummim. Where else do they mention these? If I can get hmm, 2830. That's an interesting verse, but I want one that explains these in more detail. This they, they describe this. I thought there's a place where it explains the Urim and Thummim more closely. Oh, I'll do it this way. Um, Back here. Okay, so it must be. I don't understand. Any anybody know where I miss what I'm missing here? 
where it talks about how the Urim and Thummim work. Anybody know what that is? Where that is? I'm going to look at these verses here in Ezra. So Ezra 6 4. Um, or two, I don't know why I said 6 4. Two, Ezra 2, verse 63. <laughs> um, and the Tershatha said unto them that they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up the priest with the Urim and Thummim. 4,360. 4,260. 42,360. 42,360. I'm sorry, I'm just thinking. Okay. So in this story here, um, we have this in Ezra, and we have a similar thing in Nehemiah. So these are going to be the exiles that return, become with Zerubbabel. Um, so this is going to be under Cyrus's decree. And so it has in this verse, Ezra 2, verse 63, um, so they go through this genealogy, and, and they number all these different people, and the total is 42,360, uh, besides their servants and their mates, of whom there were 7,337, so 7,337. And among them were 200 singing men and women. Their horses, they count. I know it seems like we're, we're kind of going down a rabbit hole here, but... And we have this as well in Nehemiah. So if we go back, Nehemiah, it's going to basically give us uh, the same information. It's just the same same stuff. They're going to say, they should not eat of the most holy things till there stood up a priest with Urim and Thummim. Anybody else have information about the Urim and Thummim? Urim and Thummim? I just thought it would have been here um, where it talks about them, but it doesn't seem to talk about how they work. So I was pretty sure that there was a place where it talked about their function. Because one, I believe, maybe it's in the spirit of prophecy. Anybody know? Nobody knows? I can't find nothing. Okay. So, so for now, going back to this paper, why we're here, so we took this power and courage again. We, we added them together. We got this number 7405, right? And that's the word bind. And we looked at that word in Exodus 2828. It's also in 3921. So it's in those two verses. It's the only place that that word exists. And adding power and courage together to get that, um, how does that help us? <laughs> In understanding, he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. So we're, we're taking this as the United States and the papacy in our history. In historically, this is pagan Rome under Octavian. He's the king of the north, king of the north, king of the north, and he shall stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south. So this is 1989, and, and we can see that with a great army. I mean, so in our history, this this great army is the army of the United States. So in in um, Daniel chapter eleven, verse forty, it's going to be the chariots and the horsemen. I guess is what we would we would align this with. That would be the present truth application. So again, the king of the south under Anthony, that's going to be the Soviet Union. Now it says, uh, the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army, but the king of the south is going to lose. So Egypt's going to lose. So that's going to be the Battle of Actium. And so the Battle of Actium becomes a type of November 9th, 1989. So we would just... Now, when it says they shall forecast his devices against him, what would this be referring to in our history? So what's the forecasting of the devices? Any thoughts on that? So when they forecast their devices from the strongholds, uh, we, we connect those two things, right? So remember we had, okay, so Dwight wants us to look at Patriarchs and Prophets, page 351. You, you ask questions as to the... Urim and Thummim. Okay. 
And those are direct references along with Signs of the Times, 13th of January of 1881, paragraph 7. Okay. I'll look at the Signs of the Times one. What, what, it's, it's eight, what did you say? Which year? Just a moment. 13 January, 1881, okay. paragraph 7. Yeah, so by the laying on of Moses' hands and a most impressive charge, Joshua was solemnly set apart as the leader of Israel. He was also admitted to a present share in the government as an evidence to the people that no jealousy stirred the heart of Moses at the thought that another was to take his place and lead Israel to the promised land. Moses instructed the people to respect Joshua and inspired them with confidence in him as the man divinely appointed as his successor. The word of the Lord came through Moses to the congregation. He shall stand before Eleazar the priest, who shall ask counsel for him after the judgment of Urim before the Lord. At his word they shall go out, and at his word they shall come in, both he and the children of Israel with him, even all the congregation. Okay, so there's that one. So, I mean, we know that this is seeking counsel of God. And the other ones in Patriarchs and Prophets. And those represent the totality of Mrs. White's direct comments. Okay. Yeah, it's just I have a hard time finding pages with the way that I do it here. There's probably a way of doing it more easily. I have to go through the chapters and then click on them. Okay, so the first one, 351. Okay. That one I found, describing his clothes. At the right and left of the breastplate were two large stones of great brilliancy. These were known as the Urim and the Thummim. By them, the will of God was made known through the high priest. When questions were brought for the decision before the Lord, a halo of light encircling the precious stone at the right was a token of the divine consent or approval, while a cloud shadowing the stone at the left was an evidence of denial or disapprobation. Okay, so that's the statement I want. So that's probably where I got that. Sorry, I'm not talking. I'm thinking here and doing some stuff, just trying to figure this out. So when we look at this uh, Urim and Thummim, so let's go here. So we're we're directed to this breastplate. Now we we weren't, you know, we we take this power and courage. It gives us this binding. It gives this binding of uh, this breastplate. And the breastplate has on it the Urim and Thummim. Well, the ephod does, right? So, so you put it in the, in the breastplate of judgment, the Urim and Thummim. So I'm not sure exactly. I, I think those are kind of a part of it. So it says in the breastplate of judgment. And they shall be upon Aaron's heart when he goeth in before the Lord. And Aaron shall bear the judgment of the children of Israel upon his heart before the Lord continually. And we're looking at this binding. So the binding of the breastplate by the rings thereof, unto the rings of the ephod. Um, now, Urim and Thummim themselves, uh, Urim is 224, and Thummim is uh, 8537. So together they're 8761. How do you see it as 8537? Thummim? Oh, I don't know. I don't know how I saw it as 8537, because it's... 8550, right? Correct. What was I looking at? I have no idea. Take take a look at the word again and see if the uh, if the number is derived from something. Okay. Oh, it's derived from 8537. That's why. From perfections. So lights and perfections is the word. So 8550 plus 224. You get 8774. We use that as a span of time. We just want 24 years and a few days. That would be eight days. So 24 years and eight days if you add those together. Thummim and Thummim. Urim and Thummim. Now together, it's kind of interesting. Um, if you take Urim, Urim and Thummim and you just look at the gematria of them, the normal sum is 158, so that's the 15th of August. And the reverse sum, re reverse sum is 139, so that's 391 backwards. So that's the reverse, so you get uh, 391 and you get 
the midnight cry symbol. Two kind of powerful symbols. Yeah. Okay. Looking at these, I just want to look at these in Hebrew. So they got Ha'urim, so the Urim and Ha'thumim. And I'm just going to check this. So that's, there it is in Hebrew. The Hebrew gematria of those, that whole phrase is uh, 1565. If I just take the words themselves, it's 747. I know it's a little bit slow here thinking this through. So I'll, I'll tell you sort of what my mind's doing, whether it makes any sense or not. I guess that's for people to decide. Okay, so what we have is we have this, these, both of these king's hearts shall be to do mischief, right? Let me see. Let's go back here. I've got to go back to verse 25. Okay, so he shall stir up power and courage against the king of the south. So this is going to be the king of the north, stirring up his power and courage. And and so power and courage, this is, um, this is the character of the king of the north. Now, the word courage is just heart, understanding. Power refers to being firm, right, ability. So the king of the north is going to stir up his power and courage against the king of the south. We marked this in 1989. Now, the king of the south, um, he's going to stir up to battle as well with a very great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. And the day is who? What did we decide that they was? We had, we had a lot of discussion about it. We didn't write anything in particularly. Now the forecasting of devices that we get from verse uh, 24, right? He's going to forecast his devices against the strongholds. And we have two different ways, from the strongholds or against the strongholds. And we have this period even for a time. So when we're going to deal with this battle of Actium here, it says they shall forecast his device, devices against him. This is going to be Octavian and his army. Who, who's forecasting his devices against who in, in the historic application? Well, when we're, we're placing this with Octavian and his, and his army, then we have to be using Antony and his forces, right? Yeah, well, so it's going to be they against him. The question is why they against him and not him against him. But they, as as we would be attempting to address it right now, could be Antony and Cleopatra. Yeah, right. Or it could be the army itself. Well, it, Antony it's interesting. Antony and Cleopatra. Because it's they for, so you're saying that Antony and Cleopatra are going to forecast their devices against Octavian. That would seem to make sense, mm-hmm. especially with what we're what we're applying on the historical application at that time. Yeah. I, I, okay, but well, so what is the forecasting of the devices that happens from Rome? Because we know that they're going to forecast their devices even for a time, right? So we spent a lot of time there. Is it a different power forecasting its devices, or is it the same power? Well, here again, if we use, as we have in the past, the rule of first mention to try to more properly understand the devices, Mm -hmm. we would have to go back to Genesis 6-5. Yeah, which which we did in our previous regarding, Right. right? And so that's going to be... God saw the wickedness of man that it was great, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, right? So we're going to have uh, this word that's translated devices is here called thoughts, a, a contrivance that is um, concretely texture, machine, or abstractly intention plan, right? So this is a plot. And so the idea here is that that men are plotting or planning, uh, and generally in this evil sense. And it's going to be the thoughts of his heart, love, love, right? So the, the idea of the sound of the heart that it makes. So um, if we go back to 
Daniel 11, verse 25, you're going to have courage there and power. And then you're going to have these devices. So um, the forecasting of his devices and forecast. That means to fabricate or weave. So these are our plans that are cunning, you know, cunning plans against him. Now, I mean, I guess we could say that Anthony and Cleopatra do some forecasting of devices against the king of the north. I guess that is possible. That one I never considered before. Now, in in the situation, Antony being the more experienced field general and Octavian sitting down having these conversations. I mean, Antony and Cleopatra would have thought that because of Antony's experience and the breadth of their of their forces, that they would have been greater than what Octavian would have had. That Octavian was not as strong of a military commander as either Pompey, Julius Caesar, or many of the others that that had preceded Octavian. Yeah, and that's why he ends up defeating him in the Battle of Actium in in a uh, uh, a maritime battle, right? And and the guy who I can I forget his name again, um, who basically was commanding the fleet. I mean, it was his genius that really allowed Octavian to defeat Anthony and Cleopatra there. And the fact that after that, you know. Uh, Anthony's army and his navy basically join with Octavian. I mean, that's really where he's defeated. Obviously, the aftermath is going to be what happens in 30 BC. Um, that's just a result of what happened with the Battle of Actium. So the Battle of Actium becomes the main focus of the defeat of Egypt. So I guess then in looking at this verse, so he's going to forecast his devices against the king of the north. That's what you're saying. Correct. And then it says, they, Anthony's army, that feed of the portion of the meat of the king's army, shall destroy him and his, Octavian's army, shall um, overflow and many shall fall down slain. So Anthony's army and navy will be defeated. And so we, we looked at this whole thing about the grain. Um, so the king of the south's army is dependent upon Egypt for grain. So we know that uh, they're going to be the ones that are going to, in a sense, destroy him. Anthony committing suicide August 1st, 30 BC in Egypt. And then we have this symbol of the Sunday law. Octavian's army shall overflow and many shall fall down slain. So we have November. So we're trying to put this into our history. But we have all of these different uh, clues, you know, that we're looking at. We're trying to find these symbols and see how they apply. And, and we're trying to create a line here. Right? So the idea is that we can take this history and we should be able to see a line. Let me just go back here. Well, there seems to be something that I know. So anyway, what this does is this brings us from 1989 to the Sunday law as a symbol, the overflowing. So verse 25 and 26 is a line. It doesn't give us a lot of detail. Okay, what if we applied this instead of to 1989? Because we're zooming into an, another line. What if this is really addressing uh, the history with Parminder's movement? So it's just a thought. That could be a very good thought. Yeah, yeah, so, so, you know, can we take Anthony and Cleopatra as representing Parminder and Tess? Yes. Just, yeah, as, as this power of the King of the South. And definitely when it comes to them forecasting their devices, uh, against, uh, him, well, then we have to look here at, at, so we have the King of the North. Now, look, so the king of the south representing Parminder and Tess makes sense, right, because of their philosophy. But now that means we're going to take Octavian, and he's going to represent what? Just the conservative aspects within the movement? 
Is it going to be FFA itself? I would almost have to think it would be FFA. Okay. And they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So the problem is we have his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. So there's there's something there's something I'm not seeing. I'm not sure if I understand. I hate when I don't understand something. That's where I'm kind of stuck here. Okay, so what, what I'm thinking is we have this parallel between 1989, because it's November 9th, and 1989 and 2019, right? That's what we're looking at, just to be clear. So we're saying that, well, this represents 1989. That is, we understand that the Battle of Actium and the fall of Rome both are typifying what's going to happen at the end of the world, right? But not completely. That is, we don't take these literally. We understand there to be, it's a spiritual application. And uh, that there is a difference between the fall of pagan Rome and what's going to happen at the end of the world. And what was the difference that we had between the fall of pagan Rome and at the end of the world? It had to do with the papacy. How did we describe that yesterday? Anybody remember? Can't remember. I can't remember how we described it. We had a way of, of explaining it. Let's see if I can find this. Okay, so let me look through this. So the latter is the start, starts on November 9th, 1989. The former is going to address 1798, right? So we had the latter is representing the fall of Egypt. And, and we understand that in the fall of Egypt, when we look at what happens in 1798, we don't apply the literal king of the north and the literal king of the south, correct? So that's, so that's going to be the former. Did I say latter? So that's going to be the former, right? So there's, it's not going to be as the former as, and as the latter. We discussed that yesterday. And so the idea of the former is that it's not going to be the literal Right, it's going to be spiritual. So it's not going to be literal king of the north and literal king of the south. And when it comes to the latter, how did we describe that? We had a way that we explained it, which I thought made sense. Because in the latter, we have the ships of Kittim. They're going to cause the fall of Western Rome. So I keep asking the question. I'm just looking at the transcript. Right. Okay, so... Ah, so it had to do with the idea that that the United States itself is going to be the one that that is going to bring in the Sunday law in our history. So the papacy is behind what happens in our history, right, with the fall of the Soviet Union. But the United States is the one that is actually acting as the armies of Rome, right? And it's going to be the one that makes the image of the beast. That was what we did. So we compared it with Revelation 13. So in Revelation 13, we have the image to the beast. That's the United States. So if we're going to apply this, if we're going to take this history and we're going to, we're going to parallel what happened in the movement as, as a, an internal parallel to the external. I mean, is that how we, we would look at it? I mean, it is pretty clear that in the movement, when Parminder's movement left, we had the woke aspect of the movement leave. And, and a lot of people who are, we would have considered conservative just became instantly woke, right? Like almost overnight. And then everybody who was, who didn't leave congratulated themselves that they weren't like these other people are, right? Because they were conservatives. So we're on the right side of the issue. But were we on the right side of the issue? No. We're okay. Looking to ourselves. We're looking to ourselves. So okay. Okay. So, because so, the issue itself wasn't really woke against conservative within, within what God wanted. Right? It wasn't. So people could be conservative, but that didn't save them. And the fact that we sympathize with 
the right instead of the left doesn't make us righteous. I mean, we can obviously say there's a lot more sensible things about the right than the left in that context of what's happening in the world, except that it's going to be the right that is going to bring in the Sunday law, not the left. So, so one of the things about what Parminder and Tess were saying, at least what I thought they should have been saying, so first they talked about, well, we're opposed to conspiracy theories. I thought, well, that's good, except that they were just using leftist conspiracy theories. So when Tess brought up, you know, the, the Steele dossier, and I'm like, well, that's not true. I mean, that's just a bunch of gossip. You know, that's just a leftist conspiracy theory. And, and, and also the one conspiracy theory that they tried to downplay was the Jesuit conspiracy theory, which we know is supported by the spirit of prophecy. Like there is a conspiracy and it is the Jesuits. Just because there's a lots of other weird conspiracy theories that aren't true and that are distortions of truth that are basically smoke screens. Um, the one thing we can say is that the Jesuits are real. I mean, we may have lots of misinformation about what they do and how they do it. And, you know, there's all kinds of gossips and rumors about that too, but we know that the Jesuits are real, that that's not a fake conspiracy. That's a real conspiracy. And Parminder and Kess wanted to downplay that. They, they sort of mocked, especially Parminder, I heard him mock, the whole idea that there's Jesuits infiltrating the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, of course, that's ridiculous to suggest that they haven't because that's that's what they're there for. So now when we look at this and we try to parallel this i mean doesn't this give us the 777 days from november 9th 9, 2019 to december 25th 2021 because december 25th 2021 is a symbol of the sunday law so we don't so can we see that this is addressing that history that we could put this this uh parallel uh to what happens in ancient history that we can parallel it with what happens in our movement. And the question is, we have to decide what is it that has happened in our movement. Did, did, um, so we have this conflict between the King of the North and the King of the South in this movement. That is between wokeism and conservatism for just a simple way uh, to put it. Is this a victory for God that uh, Parminder's movement was de defeated by FFA, and that on December 25th, 2021, the vast majority of this movement is going to reject the message that God gave. So can this simply just describe our 777 days as a zoom into internally of this battle? Does that make sense to people? It's possible. Okay, so possible. Because we can look at the Sunday laws, December 25th, 2021, and we can look at um, the King of the South and the King of the North having a battle as November 9th, 2019. So, I mean, it's not, it's not a lot of detail in here that we can apply unless there's some of these symbols that come from these verses themselves. So some of the times this takes a little bit of work because it's a bit of math. But if we look at verse 25, um, and 26. You know, sometimes I just look at the lexical sum. So I look at the lexical sum of verse 25. That's going to be 93941. That's all the Hebrew numbers added together. And then for verse 26 is 39971. I know I was looking at this before trying to figure this out. You know, it's about a period of 257 years, the first verse. Verse 25, the other one's a period of 109 and a half years. So that's, I don't know how that would apply. Any other ideas of what we can do with these verses? Because you've got the power and the courage and the binding. So, so what is it that happens in this movement? What, what is November 9th, 2019 about? So what is it about? So Parminder and Tess set this date November 9th, 2019. Prior to that date, they're going to have this rebellion. We call it the Rebellion of Dale Peor. 
And, and that's going to be August 29th, 2019. So they, they rebel. Jeff is going to awaken. He's going to speak against that rebellion on September 7th, 2019. And then on November 9th, 2019, and in between that time, he's going to say that their predictions are going to fail regarding Russia and the United States. So November 9th, 2019, we have this, this way, Mark, there's a meeting in Arkansas. I'm there. Stephen Odadili are there on November 9th. I present the 273 dealing with the Mayan calendar. There's really much interest in that. Okay. So, so there's this close of probation for the false priest that happens. Um, so what is the battle about? Can we tie the Urim and the Thummim into this as a symbol? And then they de- forecasting the devices against him. This would be the king of the south. That's Parminder and Tess forecasting their devices against the king of the north. But, you know, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him and his army shall overflow. And many shall fall down slain. So the king of the south is going to be destroyed by its own army. And we're going to come to, and, and his army shall overflow. So this is the king of the north's army. This is the Sunday law. And many shall fall down slain. I don't know. I don't know if we can do that or not, that we can apply it to, to that history. There's definitely symbols that go from November 9th to the Sunday law. But I would need something more. Any any other thoughts on what we can do with that? Because in some way, this has to, I mean, it, it should fall into place, right? So sometimes we have to look at things for a while before we see them. I mean, if we put this as 1989, as we have done, so let's go back there um, to our paper. We have to remember that the reason that this is given is it's going to talk about forecasting their devices against or from the fortresses, even for a time, right? And so one of those starting points of the times is that 360 years that begins with the Battle of Actium. So it's going to give us the Battle of Actium. And the Battle of Actium later is going to be called uh, the former, right? It shall not be as the former or as the late, and, and it shall not be as the later, latter, Right? So, so this is going to be the former, the, the Battle of Actium. But here we have it as November 9th, 1989, because we know that in this case, it's the King of the North defeating the King of the South. And so that's 1989, not 1798. <clears throat> so when we make the present truth application of this, we're going to bring it to 1989. But we say, well, November 9th, 1989 is also November 9th, 2019. So maybe we can make a parallel to what happens within this movement in the 777 structure. But maybe that's not the primary way to look at this present truth application. Now, when when we have this overflow, we always equate this to the Sunday law. Now, the Sunday law in our history can be the pandemic as well, because that's a type of the Sunday. Um, but here I just generally have taken this as the Sunday law itself, that when Octavian's army overflows, that's typifying the Sunday law. And so we can say this goes from November 9th, 1989 to the Sunday law. Now, the Sunday law itself, we know that the Sunday laws can also equal 9-11. That is, when the mighty angel of the Revelation 18 comes down, that's the Sunday law. And so 9-11 is the Sunday law. So so we can have that symbol there. So we can say it's 9-11. So this could be representing 1989 to 9-11. So if we look at the next verses where it says, both these kings, heart shall be to do mischief. One of the things that we know about the two streams, this was Tess's presentations dealing with, um, we got CNN, MSNBC, opposed to Fox, and she's saying, you know, the, the, the real stream of truth is CNN. And if we watch Fox News, we're going to be deceived because that's the false stream. 
Now, Jeff argued, well, both streams are false. That wasn't well received by Parminder and Tess because Parminder and Tess are woke. They want to follow the government media. So when we can see that both of these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, I mean, both sides of this, the king of the north and the king of the south, are both seeking for control. They both speak lies to each other and, and just generally, but they speak lies at one table. So that obviously refers to this, this table of fellowship. But it shall not prosper. That is, these agreements uh, will not prosper. For yet, the end shall be at the time appointed. So we know that these things are going to be at war with each other. Then shall uh, the king of the north return to his own land with great riches. Now, when Swearingen does this, he tries to say, well, this is Octavian. But we know that this is actually referring to uh, later because, um, or not Octavian, but yeah, Octavian, right? He says it's Octavian. Okay, so he just puts that all in the context of the Battle of Actium. But we know that this is talking about what's going to happen later because it's going to be against the Holy Covenant and that this is the persecution of Jews or of Christians, right? Christianity in Judea and Palestine. And, and we don't have the persecution of Jews under Octavian or of Christians, I mean. And he shall, he, he does persecute Jews to some degree, but not directly. I mean, so, so I, I don't think you can apply that. And he shall do and return to his own land. And then we have at the time appointed, which we mark as November 9th, 1989. So we have in, in before we have what happens in the Battle of Actium typifies November 9th, 1989. But the time appointed here is November 9th, 1989. Right. So now it's going to say, um, he shall recur, he, um, at the time appointed November 9th, 1989, the papacy in the USA king of the north shall come and toward the south, but it shall not be as the former or as the latter. So the latter is going to be the fall of Western Rome, which is what we're going to look at in, in verse 30, right? So it's going to expand upon the latter. So we have this former and the latter tied together in verse 29, right? It's going to, it's going to tie what we just see with the Battle of Actium uh, with um, the fall of Rome. And it's going to tell us that both of these things are types of what happens at the end of the world in our history. So I hope that, I hope that's, that's being clearer then. And then when we look at verse 27 and 28, if we're going to, uh, look at these powers. So now we're going to have to look at the king of the north is. So this is going to bring us in a, in a way. Uh, so when we look at this, this is going to go back to their agreement. But we would have to put this agreement between the king of the north and the king of the south as 9-11, wouldn't we? That is, we're going to have to carry verse 25 and 26 as even though they're they're referring to an earlier history in this story. Uh, when they uh, tell lot speak lies at one table, we would have to put this as 9-11. So even though this goes back and tells of another history. This history now is going to be from 9-11 to the Sunday Law, where the other one was from 1989 to the Sunday Law, which in that case was 9-11. This now is a zoom into this, and it's going to bring us from 9-11 to the Sunday Law. Does that make sense? So at, at the end, at, and so when it says, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed, the time appointed here, which is the end of the prophetic periods in the historical application would have to be the Sunday law in our history. Then it says, then shall he, the king of the north, return into his his land with great riches. And his, in that case, it was pagan Rome's heart shall be against the holy covenant. But here it's going to be papal Rome's okay, in the present truth application. And here the holy covenant, well, we could say Christianity, Eugeo, uh, Palestine. But we could actually say also the Sabbath. And when it says that he shall do and return to his own land, how would that, what is this applying to, like historically? 
I mean, we have Rome. His own land is Rome there in the, in this history. So this is pagan Rome persecuting God's people. You know, we're going to put the destruction of Jerusalem, the persecution of Christian Christians, right? All of those things that that pagan Rome does. It's going to, and he shall do and return to his own land. So what? What are we going to do with that? I know there's a lot of thinking here. I, I end up, you know, thinking out loud. There seems to have been some fairly wide-ranging thoughts on, on a bunch of different subjects that we're trying to bring together. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Me too. Well, I mean, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this, but I, I'm not. Okay, so return to his own land. I'm just, there's so many, so many ideas here. So this word do, um, you know, it's such a common word, right? It's first mentioned in, you know, as the word made, right? In Genesis 1 verse 7, when God made everything, right? So, but it's kind of interesting that it's in, okay, so when we look at the different ways in which it's translated, so the first time that it shows up as the word do, which is the most common it's going to show up here i'll show you what i'm looking at okay so the first time we have it this word asa it's translated as do 612 times so what do we see there 612 as a symbol the digits of one two six yeah the digits of one two six or two two sixteen which is six times six times six if you did it backwards right it's two one six you also have it's in Genesis 16, 6. So what's 166 represent? Represents FFA, right? Because the six is, F is a six and A is a one. So it's just FFA backwards. And it's also Genesis 8, 15 or 18, or 18, 5, pardon me, which, which has the digits of 8, 15, right? August 15th. Okay. Now the next way that it's translated, is made, uh, that's Genesis uh, 1, verse 7, and the second one is Genesis 1, 1, 6. So you've got that sort of reverse of FFA, that's AAF. Okay. Uh, now the word done is another way it's translated. I don't see anything significant there in its first mention of that translation. But Genesis 6, 22 did... And 622, we know that represents June 22nd, which is also a symbol of FFA. And then make is Genesis 126. So we definitely have there the 126 symbol. And, and we have things connected with FFA that are 126, such as the declaration on December 6th. So can this possibly represent this, this word do, right? Which means, which is, you know, so shall he do. Is this representing FFA as uh, being the king of the north in this context, being Rome, paralleling it? I mean, I know that's that's really a stretch because we're we're kind of mixing different different symbols together, and we're not we're not looking at FFA now. We're looking at the papacy, but we have connections with FFA, and all that I'm saying about that, and it, and I'm not trying to say this in sort of. Uh, like a derogatory way. I'm not trying to, but I, one of the problems that I've had, many people have had, is the way in which FFA is operated. That is, I know Jeff made a lot about people saying, you know, that he's exercising kingly power. And I don't believe that Jeff personally was, like in a, a direct way. That is, he didn't think he was exercising kingly power. But definitely, he was exercising power that was based upon misinformation. That is rumors and gossip about people. And he has stated in a study recently, I guess two times in the study, one at the beginning and one at the end, is that we should block people who aren't in support of uh, this message. And, and I think he's talking about during the study online, uh, the Zoom study, that, you know, we don't want to have people here who aren't fully supportive of what Jeff is teaching. That falls on the same line as Parminder and Tess. Yeah, well, and and the papacy, right? Yeah, 
papacy. Yeah. So, so all I'm saying here is that this word that do six two one three, whether we apply it here in this verse specifically, because this word occurs lots of times in um, Daniel chapter eleven, right? So just at translated as do. In Daniel chapter 11, it shows up in verse 3, verse 16 and 17, verse 24, verse 28, verse 30, verse 32, verse 36, verse 39, right? So, so I'm not saying here that we're going to, to apply do in this context to FFA at the end of the world. I'm just saying that FFA may, has a parallel to this, this idea, so, and he shall do in this context of Daniel chapter 11 is referring to a characteristic that is a papal characteristic. And that characteristic is manifested, not just in FFA, but even in ourselves. And it's something that has to be addressed, right? So this has to do with, with the actions of man. And, and this is because our heart is against the Holy Covenant. Man's heart is deceitfully wicked. I know that in my flesh dwells no good thing. Our sinful nature is enmity against God not subject to the law of God, neither can be, indeed can be, right? That, that in, this, in this whole history, in what this movement has, what we're looking at in this history, God isn't just showing us the history of nations. He's showing us ourselves. We can look back at, at all of these events, all of these lines, and what we know is that they actually are representing, I didn't do this here, so it wasn't actually showing you what I was doing. So there's where are all these verses here. So, should, so there's the 612 with the um, the FFA backwards, 166, the 116, and the did 622, and then the make 126. So when I look at these verses and we look at what, what has happened in the past, we know that it typifies what's happening in the present. But it comes down also to really a personal level. You know, the one thing, the mi mistake that people made when Parminder and Tess's movement rebelled is that people congratulated themselves that they didn't rebel. But did we rebel? Are we in rebellion against God? Yeah, well, if, we well, well, especially, we especially if we all rebelled in some degree. Yeah, and especially if we're we're looking at other people as rebellious and saying. Well, I'm thankful I'm not like they are, right? Right. So, I mean, so that spirit has to change. God has to change our hearts so that we we don't exalt in other people's failures as if that is that means that we have succeeded, right? Somehow, human nature is if somebody we don't like fails, we consider that our own success. And of course, there's nothing to do with us at all. We have our own failures. And, and this has just been the problem in this movement. This has been the problem everywhere people are, is that we have not recognized our true spiritual condition. So, so we definitely can bring this down to a personal level. And I don't think that we should ignore that. But here, verse 20, 25 to 28, it's going to be addressing this defeat of the king of the south by the king of the north. But there's no difference. In, it's in both these kings' hearts uh, to do mischief. They speak lies at one table. Now, this table here is is not like a tablet, you know, like, like make it plain upon tables. This is a word that means um, it's, it's like a table of fellowship, like a king's table or for king's table for private use or sacred uses. Or kings, so you got kings, right? But but the idea is that it it means a table to as spread out by implication a meal, right? So that's going to be Strong's definition, right? And you can see by looking at different things, uh, they're going to make a table of shittim wood. That's going to be the table of showbread, right? It's going to use that word for table. Talks about the table of showbread there, Second Chronicles, Ezekiel. It's going to be talking about the table of showbread. Mostly it looks like in Isaiah 21 5, it's going to use it more as a table for eating. Ezekiel, it's going to be, right. so sometimes it refers to the sacred table, sometimes the king table. 
sometimes just a private table, table of eating, right? So we, um, this speaking of lies at one table, this has to do with the fact that there's this common fellowship between both of these powers, but it shall not prosper. Uh, for yet, now we know that word yet is od, which is an iteration. So this is going to be, be repeated at the time appointed. Right. And here we apply this uh, to 1798 to 1844 because of the, the context here. That is, this is referring to 1798 and in verse 28, or pardon me, um, verse 29, where it talks about at the time appointed, he shall return. We're going to apply that to 1989. So we have the time of the end is connected to the time appointed. It refers to a, a line from the time of the end to the Sunday law. Okay, we went way over time, but I wanted to straighten that out. Okay, let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, be, be with us through the rest of this day. And we ask for your care over each one of us. Uh, bring us together again to study your word and to sort through these things. Help us in our personal study uh, to see clearly. Uh, bless each one. May your angels watch over them, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen.